Yes, thank you very much. I mean, you'll see my title um, is, has a duality to it. Um, I am going to talk a little bit why it's important that uh, more research is actually conducted within general practice. And I was asked to comment on how you, we could improve engagement with, within general practice. And uh, I think that has become an even more important um, phrase these days. Um, I've got my competing interests there, although there are none uh, in particular in relation to this talk. So that's what I'm going to uh, briefly cover. Why is uh, more research needed um, within primary care? Um, and what can primary care uh, therefore offer the research? And I'm going to close about half the talk actually talking about strategies that might increase participation using one exemplar in the interests of time. So why is research capacity in primary care needed? Uh, and there are some fairly obvious responses to that. Um, and the most obvious is the huge demographic shift in care during our clinical lifetimes. And the realities uh, are that most uh, non-communicable disease, chronic disease, is now um, managed or principally managed in primary care, um, whether it's acute or chronic problems. And therefore, um, if we don't uh, conduct more research in primary care, we'll only be seeing the pyramid, the small pyramid, the small proportion of patients whose phenotype is sufficiently extreme for them to access hospitals on a regular basis. Another issue which is important, which touches on what we've just been hearing about, is that um, quite a lot of technologies um, are now finally becoming uh, apparent in primary care. It's been a very low-tech environment for most of my clinical career, but in terms of diagnostics and monitoring um, technologies, they are mushrooming um, as we speak, and clearly uh, it's very important to test technologies in a primary care and secondary care setting. Indeed, what specialists want from a test, which is usually very high specificity, um, is the opposite of what primary care physicians want, which is very high sensitivity. They don't want to miss disease, but um, they will accept um, a test that produces more false positives. Why? because there's going to be a filter in the referral to a hospital. So it's very important that we not only um, test more technologies in primary care settings, but also get the reference ranges and thresholds right. We've just published data suggesting, for example, that the nice defined threshold for BMP, um, which is based on hospital populations, actually is a wrong cutoff for primary care and should be 125, not 400, in terms of a filter into a potential diagnosis of heart failure. The other uh, issue is that um, primary care these days, like in hospital, uh, often has complex uh, multiple interventions which require uh, the right setting in order to evaluate them. Uh, another uh, important factor is the fact that a lot of health promotion and disease prevention takes place in primary care as well. And uh, currently, most health systems, and the uh, UK is a, a fair example of that, actually spend a relatively little proportion of their total clinical research budgets on prevention. It's only about 5% of the UK approaching 2 billion spend on clinical research actually gets spent on disease prevention. And yet most of us, if we ranked areas of clinical care which we believed um, should be, uh, have a reasonable investment, I'm sure most of us would think that preventing disease was a high priority. And of course, how we configure care, particularly in these days of constantly changing um, processes of delivering care um, take place, we need to evaluate them in the right settings as well. So what can primary care actually bring the research? That argues why we the research needs primary um, care in a generic sense, but what can primary care actually offer to some of these questions? Well, obviously, an important and increasing one is the feasibility and practicality of doing studies because of this um, care setting, this shift of care of many patients out into the community. And it is, um, therefore, important uh, and not all research, but some types of research would be very difficult to conduct if you didn't actually uh, access or at least um, filter the patients in from primary care settings. And of course, that's more also important in terms of the reliability of the study findings. 
because the full range of phenotype is, present, is represented in primary care. And it is certainly true to say that there have been quite a number of examples of interventions which have big effect sizes in the extreme phenotype and lower effects in uh, more mild populations. And clearly what we want are data that is represented across the variety of disease expression. And also increasingly in our multicultural, multi-ethnic society, um, representation across all ages, but also ethnicities and economic groups is important as well. And something I think which is going to bedevil us for the next 20 years or so is this concept of multimorbidity. In fact, I think uh, a lot of uh, investigational trials involve uh, far more complex patient types than you would think if you read some of the recent reviews about multimorbidity and the lack of evidence for patients with multiple disorders. But I think we need to get cuter about um, having a priori more um, subgroup analysis by um, morbid conditions within trials in order to at least answer this question that, that the data we have only applies to single disease states, which is believed by quite a high proportion of clinicians. And also, patients out there in the community are wandering around exposing themselves to sun, tripping over the steps in ALDI, and therefore, actually, um, you may well improve the reliability of trial data in terms of adverse events, etc. The other thing that I think we sometimes underestimate is the added value of conducting research. This is true whether in a hospital or a primary care setting, um, but uh, there are data to show that clinicians who take part in research, whether doctors or nurses, actually become more expert in the condition under investigation and become early adopters if the data are positive for the intervention. And we shouldn't be underestimating this. The NHS actually doesn't even think about those sorts of issues, but the training component of conducting research and the, uh, this early dissemination of findings is actually a big, big plus of incentivizing research within the NHS. So how can we improve general practice engagement? I mean, there are absolutely no magic bullets here, as I'm sure you would, be say, uh, you would uh, answer to me, and you would also be pointing out how <coughs> difficult it is for you to engage practices these days, and it's difficult for us too. So it has got a lot more difficult, but these are components that may improve things. It is essential to actually test some of the components of trials before implementing them, and that means you need to be able to understand how a practice works uh, and practice flows occur, because little things will sometimes provide big blocks. It's always more difficult in primary care to do um, recruitment, for example, that is opportunistic, i.e., you see a patient presenting at that point, and it's at that point you need to actually recruit them into the trial for obvious reasons, because you're disrupting a high volume, short consult flow, and the likelihood that you can get clinicians to actually extend consultations, even briefly, in order to enter patients in studies at that moment in time, is obviously more complex. There are things you can do to get around that, even that complexity, but it's, it's something you have to test. Um, streamlining processes is key. We all want to collect data that may or may not be actually analysed downstream, but we think it's efficient to collect it at the time. And unfortunately, the greater the complexity, the more information that's com uh, collected, the less likely you are to take part. This has been a very uh, important issue, which is that we have to recognise that uh, the general practice contract is a service contract. They are funded uh, by the NHS merely to provide a clinical service. And the NHS accepts that if practices take part in teaching or research, they need a increment, a cost increment to actually cover that activity because it's outside of the NHS contract with practices. And so working out um, what that requires in terms of service support costs is very important. And latterly, this has become a bigger issue, the uh, treatment, excess treatment costs with CCGs declining primary care studies as readily as they probably decline hospital studies. 
Uh, there are, though, other things, uh, and certainly investment in infrastructure and um, relationships with academic departments of primary care, I think, can help. Uh, why? Because I think there are a range of methodologists um, present in academic departments who will have probably tackled some of the issues that you might be um, wanting to overcome. And also, um, primary care clinical trials units not only um, deliver the sort of classic CTU functions, um, but often uh, have some expertise and investment in things that are particularly helpful in a primary care setting, um, such as, for example, um, making best use of electronic or digital methods of both identifying patients, but also flagging them and actually um, uh, recruiting uh, data in that way as well. And a very important point is potentially having bank staff practices go through peaks and troughs in workload and uh, sometimes may be willing, willing to take part in a study but don't have capacity themselves at that point but may be prepared to support if um, actually you can provide the support to them. And of course, that was one of the reasons for networks Although, in fact, I think networks, um, as they're currently configured, has actually been a retrograde step because it's dislocated the uh, network management function from the researchers who are conducting um, the research. And uh, I think, if anything, it's actually probably more difficult now to recruit through practice research networks than it perhaps was five to ten years ago. So I've just got one example. I've chosen AF, I'm sorry, I could have chosen a hypertension one, uh, I suppose I should have done really, but I think this makes some of the points uh, more easily. So I'm afraid you're going to get a little rapid update on stroke prevention in AF. Um, is it important? Well, it is, because stroke uh, AF is one of the increasing prevalent chronic uh, cardiac diseases. It's one of the few that are increasing in prevalence. And, uh, of course, its significance as an arrhythmia is is not so great, but its significance in terms of a driver of stroke is enormous. Five-fold increase uh, risk of stroke, probably responsible for about 20% of all strokes, probably near a 30% in the elderly. And it doesn't just cause more strokes through thrombus formation, but it also causes more severe strokes, uh, more severe, whether it's in the acute or recovery phase, about three times the level of severe disability if you have your stroke in association with atrial fibrillation. And it's not minor significant uh, issues that are made worse, it's major problems uh, like paralysis, aphasia and dysarthria. So it's an incredibly important uh, health prevention target because it's common it's a, cause, it's a common cause of stroke, and it causes more severe strokes. And, of course, we have very effective treatment. We've had 50 years. We've had anticoagulation, um, principally uh, warfarin, vitamin K antagonists, although latterly uh, no arcs have joined the ranks. But for 50 years, we had warfarin with a huge uh, treatment effect size, 65% risk reduction in stroke if uh, you anticoagulate a patient. And for 50 years, there was no alternative, although many uh, used aspirin, although if you look at this comparative data between warfarin versus aspirin, then warfarin retains almost its entire treatment benefit, even against this active comparator, and aspirin has an absolute marginal role in uh, warfarin, even on the historical data. But as we know, uh, up until latterly, Half of patients at risk of stroke were on aspirin rather than warfarin. And the reason for that was because we were as worried about aspirin, as, uh, warfarin causing bleeding, i.e. having risk, as we were about it actually reducing stroke. And the, one of the main reasons for that was the pooled meta-analysis in 2002 by Walraven which split the ages from the trials into under 75s, warfarin uh, versus any comparator, and over 75s. And you can see that in the under 75s, you've got this treatment dominant effect, the NNT hugely outweighing the number needed to harm. Hence, uh, you wouldn't be in equipoise, you would want to anticoagulate younger people. But the same comparison looking at patients over 75 suggesting 
number needed to treat and number needed to harm were the same. And it was these data that reinforced physician perception that warfarin was dangerous in those over 75, and therefore they defaulted to aspirin. And yet this is the important population because that's where most AF was occurring. Hence, uh, the BAFTA trial, um, we designed that in order to answer this question once and for all, because all of these data have been placed on subgroups. There hadn't been a trial that was exclusively in those over 75. And um, we also wanted to have a trial with few exclusion criteria and based in general practice. And that required both patients, but it also required physician equipoise and practices prepared to initiate and monitor warfarin. So a, a really complex intervention for the practices, because when we did BAFTA, they weren't doing this. And then, as is usually the case with studies, we ran into lots of problems. The prevalence was lower than we'd anticipated. Uh, our uh, our um, recruitment inclusion criteria were too restrictive, so we broadened those, allowing patients who were on warfarin and in equipoise to be randomized if they selected. We uh, massively increased practice numbers, up to 250 uh, practices that were required, and dropped the power, and were fighting a battle with the MRC who um, funded this study because they wanted to stop it. They didn't think we'd be able to do it, and eventually allowed us a six-month no-cost extension, um, but said we had to stop when we'd had that extension, and they would not permit us to continue the study beyond there. But suffice to say, we did just uh, complete the study. And what did it show? It showed that basically warfarin was much more effective than aspirin in preventing stroke. 50% risk reduction, almost identical for what you'd have expected from earlier meta-analysis. But safety, it was as safe as aspirin. So much more effective and similar safety in terms of major bleeds as patients going on to aspirin. And there were a variety of reasons for this. Why were these data different from the subgroups? Well, obviously, it was a much bigger study. It was powered for this outcome. It was, uh, it was all comers, um, and therefore a more reliable result. But the explanation, probably, was this one, which is that, obviously, we all know that you have to seek uh, warfarin target INR 2 to 3, uh, because otherwise you will bleed in excess, or it will be placebo if it's too low. And if you look at the historic warfarin trials, in the box there, you can see what the target INRs in the studies were. And these were the two big ones, particularly SPAF1. And their INR target was 2 to 4. And in AFSCAP, it was 2.5 to 4.5. And so in these earlier trials, they'd be overdosing the patients on warfarin. And of course, that would have contributed to their observation of more bleeding in their populations. So despite the difficulties, it was a very positive result. It uh, was a huge undertaking for practices and the investigators. But because of its definity, it very rapidly changed international guidelines um, in, well, across the planet and has really uh, risen lost um, aspirin as a treatment option in atrial fibrillation. There were quite a number of things we had to do in terms of um, practice engagement. Obviously, um, there was a, a big training component to this, uh, largely because we also had to train the practices in how to set up an anticoagulation service, because they were doing near patient testing and anticoagulant follow-up, as well as the usual things you would do. And therefore, it was incredibly important that we got the costings right for in terms of all that extra work they were doing. We removed all of the issues for practices in identifying eligible patients in terms of setting up preloaded um, electronic uh, search um, for the registers. There was a, an added value to the practices because we were validating all of their AF diagnoses, and this was at the introduction of QOF, so that potentially was a useful added value for them from taking part in the research. We left them the equipment at the end of the trial, and we did all the usual things during it. And in fact, interesting enough, um, this eventually was adopted as the model of best care by the NHS, and they turned our training program into a nationally enhanced service for general practice. So those practices taking part in the study were able to continue to provide that service, and 
rather than be funded from research, they could then be funded from uh, clinical services. But lots and lots of um, issues in relation to since that time, R&D processes and GCP processes have got even more stringent than they were then, and there's less uh, and there's much more NHS demands on practices. And I've just put four slides in before I finish to illustrate that point, because you probably don't believe some of the work pressures in practice currently. But these are the most recent data about the NHS investment in uh, general practice over the, the five years um, prior to 2012-13. There aren't data since then. The only thing we know is that uh, things have got worse since 2012-13, and they got particularly worse in 2014-15. But even in the five years preceding 2012-13, you can see a virtually flat investment in general practice. And uh, not surprisingly, the reason why it went up a bit, if you remember, that was the much vaunted new GP uh, contract coming into play. And uh, if you look at proportionate spend um, on general practice as, a, as the percentage of the total NHS expenditure, you can see it has declined actually very rapidly in real terms from what was perceived as the golden investment in general practice. This was the NHS overpaying GPs and irritating um, prime ministers as a consequence of this perception of them being overpaid. This is this period here, and you can see how rapid the clawback was. So from nearly 11% of NHS spend to 8.5%, it's estimated that it's currently under 7% of the NHS budget. And uh, there has been a very modest increase in GP numbers uh, during that um, similar period. This is the big issue. Uh, hospital numbers, hospital doctor numbers during this time increased 50%. And the same with practice nurses. So basically very few additional practitioners operating in a um, work-stressed uh, environment. Now, uh, just one final slide, because I think increasingly what we look for are pragmatic, simple study designs. Uh, this is just an example from the industrial sector um, in relation to men's urinals. Um, you may be surprised to hear, if you're not a man in the room, that men uh, tend to miss this receptacle and tend to actually put as much urine on the walls as possible comparing sizes, um, thinking about something else, or hitting the wrong point of the urinal are the main problems here. And some whizzy people did two things. They first of all worked out where you had to urinate in order to get most of the urine going down these holes, and they identified the spot that was necessary. And then they did a very simple intervention, which is to paint a fly on that spot. <laughs> and men like aiming, and uh, hey, whiz, Simple intervention, lots less urine around the top. And what we want is more of those sorts of whizzy interventions in uh, clinical research. And that's my summary. Thank you very much. <laughs>